What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think Arizona? Desert? Heat? Perhaps the Colorado River? Well, the Colorado River is not the only river in the state. There is actually a network of rivers dotting the internal part of the state. Rivers like the Agua Fria, the Verde, Salt, and Gila rush through the plentiful canyons that line the interior of Arizona. Most all of Arizona's interior rivers, with few exceptions, exist in this narrow band known as the Transition Zone, Arizona's Riverlands. It's essentially an area of deep canyons which transports water from cliffside springs in high elevations down to lower elevations in the Phoenix Valley. The Transition Zone is defined by two massive geologic regions the Basin and Range Province, and the Colorado Plateau. The Colorado Plateau, it's a large plateau that was uplifted around the same time as the Rockies and still uplifts today via a process known as mantle upwelling, which I will talk about later. It's a largely undeformed high elevation region and it's different from the Basin and Range because it largely lacks those mountain valley complexes that the Basin and Range is famous for. The Basin and Range is a giant geologic area where Earth's outer layer known as the crust is being stretched, which causes mountains to rise and valleys to be sunk. And here at the transition zone, where we have influence from the Colorado Plateau due to the general elevation gain of the region, as well as influence from the Basin and Range because of the myriad of mountain ranges and vast valleys that dot the area. Let's overview how the Basin and Range and Colorado Plateau formed to help easily explain the transition zone. First, we have the Basin and Range. This is a massive mountainous region that is largely debated when it comes to its origin. Quickly, let's look at two of the leading theories. First theory is based on rotation. To cover this, we need to back up. Earth's crust is broken up into plates. Plates are essentially massive areas of the crust that move separately from one another. They move by essentially getting dragged by large convection currents in the soft plastic-like mantle, which is a part of inner earth that sits right beneath the crust and is quite a bit hotter and a lot more pressurized. The way plates move in relation to each other determines their boundaries two plates coming together is known as a convergent boundary, two plates splitting apart is known as a divergent boundary, and two plates sliding past each other is known as a transform boundary. Now many of y'all have heard of the San Andreas Fault. It's a transform boundary between the Pacific and North American plates. The Pacific plate is roughly moving northwest. This movement caused other faults like the Walker Lane to form further inland to compensate for this dragging movement on the seams of the North American plate. These faults create a rotational effect that causes extension of parts of the Southwest that compensates for these intense transform forces. Now let's focus on theory number two that states that the extension in the basin and range is actually caused by hot upwelling mantle rock. The crust in the basin and range is not all that thick, and because of this, researchers believe that it's putting less pressure and weight onto the mantle, which is allowing the mantle to rebound and actually press up on the crust, causing it to extend in that region. But let's focus on the big picture, what does this extension really do? Extension creates more faults. Faults compensate for crustal movement. These faults tend to form parallel to each other in extensional systems. When this happens, something known as Horst and Graben topography is generated. Areas of the crust in between these faults are dropped down, and these are known as the Grabens. The others are raised up, and these are known as the Horsts. This pattern generates the very linear looking mountain terrain that we can observe on any satellite map of the region today. Whew, okay. Now it's time to talk about the Colorado Plateau. 30 to 70 million years ago, there was a convergent boundary, meaning two plates coming together, between North America and a now subducted plate known as the Farallon. This event was called the Laramie Orogeny. 
Subduction is when a denser plate is pushed under a less dense plate at a convergent boundary, causing the plate that was pushed under to descend back into the hot mantle in the inner earth. So now back to the Colorado Plateau. When the Farallon Plate, which is now no longer present at the surface, was subducting, it also created a similar mantle uplift effect, like the one we were talking about beforehand with the basin and range. This uplifting force affected the Colorado Plateau differently because it's tectonically stable. But what does that mean? So here are a couple of the things that make the Colorado Plateau tectonically stable. The region has a cool geotherm, meaning the rock in the inner crust and upper mantle below the Colorado Plateau is relatively cool. Cooler rock means harder and more solid and more dense. It's also older rock, which is far away from plate margins. Rock in the interior parts of plates are more stable because they are not as affected by plate interactions, which tend to be most prominent at plate boundaries. Lastly, the Colorado Plateau is just pretty thick. Millions of years of mild geologic conditions allowed for absolutely mind-boggling amounts of sediment to build up and compact and compact and compact, leading to a thick, cool, stable block of rock. This block of rock now kind of acts like an island, so as the mantle upwells beneath it, it's uplifted as a solid unit, creating a large raised up region that we now call the Colorado Plateau. Okay, all right, now we got our two pieces of the puzzle. So how did the transition zone come about? Since the Colorado Plateau is still very tectonically stable, it is hard for the extensional forces that are generating the basin and range, which is on way less stable crust, to affect it. Decent sized faults like the Grand Wash Fault separate the provinces, painting a pretty clear margin between the geologic zones. On the seams of the Colorado Plateau, some faults from basin and range extension have taken hold. This has caused multiple basin and range style mountains to seemingly be right up next to the Colorado Plateau. Volcanism is apparent all throughout the transition zone because of that upwelling mantle that's affecting both the basin and range and the Colorado Plateau. See that upwelling mantle is able to extrude magma onto the surface through fault pathways that are found all throughout this region. Here in Black Rock Canyon, hundreds of feet of exposed basalt are present from the volcanism that used to exist in this region. Faults that create these mountains and volcanic conditions generate a lot of fractures, which are breaks in rocks created due to some stress, like tectonic movement of the crust being compensated for along faults. These fractures are then weak points in the rock that can be easily eroded away by wind and water. After millions of years, this leads to giant canyons and narrow river channels. Then, blam! Your transition zone is now in existence. I'm uh, putting my shirt up to act as a little bit of a windshield here. Why doesn't everything in the transition zone just look like Sedona? Well, it comes down to different rock types. Just because the region was uplifted together doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to consist of the same rock throughout the region. So here in Sedona, where soft sandstone and easily dissolvable limestone can be eroded away with relative ease, creating these awesome formations, places like Black Rock Canyon that have tougher igneous rock don't get broken down nearly as easily, so they look completely different. The Colorado Plateau, on average, receives a lot more rain and snowfall than other parts of Arizona. It also has great aquifer rock, which is groundwater-bearing rock, which makes the seams of the plateau an extremely bountiful area for natural springs where groundwater is pushed out to the surface. I'm at the Agua Fria River, and this is a great time to talk about the myriad of creeks and rivers that go through the transition zone. How are all these creeks and rivers still going well into Arizona's arid season? Well, for that, we have to talk about how natural springs work. You see, when water enters the ground and goes into the groundwater table, it can be pressurized by the rock above it and forced back out onto the surface in an area of lower topography. That's why you see a lot of natural springs immediately after elevation drops. 
Arizona has a ton of these in the transition zone because it's a region that is full of elevation changes. So you have rivers like the Agua Fria that run all year round. All these factors essentially make the region the water storage powerhouse of the state, and it distributes the water down hundreds of canyons and valleys that dot the transition zone, and eventually all the way down to Phoenix. And everything mentioned in this video combined gives you the magnificent riverlands of Arizona that we see today.